Day 780 of the Ukrainian War Map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian War. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So, starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses, as currently, Russia sits on more than 453,000 military personnel losses, which represents an additional 890 in the past day. Then as for hardware losses, so 5 tanks, 20 APVs, a whopping 34 artillery, and 2 air defense systems. Then we'll head across to the map today, and we'll start out in the Donbass as a missile strike rocked the Russian-occupied city of Luhansk, as captured on video. The heavy explosion reportedly occurred at either a machine building plant or a workshop for the military, or by the sounds of things, a combination of the two. The Moscow-installed head of the occupied region claimed that the Ukrainian forces launched several missiles at the Russian-controlled factory just before it was set to start operating. All of which is a typically classic AFU action, waiting for the opportune moment to strike a facility or military asset. And just taking a look at this still of the Storm Shadow cruising just unaffected by Russian air defences still feels like an exceptionally lucky situation. But given that Russia cannot even protect some of its biggest cities or military airfields or other various sites back home, then it's really no surprise how these fly so uninhibited, so unrestrained into Russian-controlled airspace. Now, Ukrainian officials have not commented on the unverified claims, but we clearly saw the Storm Shadow with its iconic pop-out flight stabilizing wings, which are actually a critical part of its design, enabling it to maintain a low altitude flight path and making it less detectable to radar systems. And so there it is, as it went, en route, flying to its final destination. And doing so at least uh, about 100 kilometers or so from the contact point in Ukraine. Then we'll head across to the Bakhmut axis, as it was yesterday that the occupying forces made a very extreme protrusion on the southeast of this zone very dangerously which is a move that offers very limited protection, as Russian forces continue to have Shasivyar in their sight. And in terms of the rivers or canals in this local region, related to this move, there is a 300 meter or so opening that Russian forces are clearly looking to push up to. But of course, it would make no sense for Russian forces to only keep pushing on this narrow attack vector as it's going to be deadly enough on the other side of the or that canal gap with some or multiple forms of defensive fortifications instituted to stop the Russian army from simply walking through uh, right there without any painfully fierce combat engagements which they would surely meet. And I do mean walking as it's expected to only be Russian infantry traversing this small gap as the amount of armored vehicle booby traps, let's say, just beyond this gap is likely going to make it pretty untenable for them to traverse on tracks or wheels. Then we'll head a bit further south where there weren't a lot of updates on the well-known Berdichi front Although we did see footage of a Ukrainian Bradley M2 IFV, so an infantry fighting vehicle, as it was fighting at and around the area, striking at Russian-held rubble with its 25mm Bushmaster chain gun fire. And so as for the wider Donbass Eastern Front, Commander-in-Chief of Ukraine's Armed Forces, Alexander Sersky, has conceded that the, this Eastern Front has deteriorated in recent days due to the warm, dry weather that has allowed Russia to intensify its armoured assaults on various axes of attack. He also stated that the heightened offensives coincides with a shortage of ammunition for Ukrainian forces compounded by delays in military aid. And so the current path is said to be that the AFU is working to stabilize the situation by fortifying vulnerable defense areas with electronic warfare and air defense. 
Then looking around the map, because somewhere in the east there was a downed Russian Shahed 136 drone. And given the nature of how it is still relatively intact, I would venture a guess to say that it was taken out by Ukraine's fire-free electronic warfare measures. And I don't know if you guys remember, but they used to call these Shahed drones $25,000 drones. Then only later it was leaked that they actually costed anywhere between $170,000 to $250,000. Which is also something that was validated by the fact that the, the MDR-208 rotary engines, one of which you can see right there, is on its own worth about 30 to 40 grand. And with a wingspan taller than your tallest basketball player at just under 8.5 feet for these contraptions, a lot of work and components go into these one-way UAVs. Which makes it surprising that their payload size is not as big as you might think, at anywhere between 20 to 40 kilos, or about 45 to 90 pounds. Then, also in the east, Ukraine destroyed a Buk M1 air defense system near Novomikhailivka, where also Russian tank and APV losses continued during daylight attacks. Then also, somewhere in the east, we saw a couple of Russians in a mad dash trying to evacuate themselves around the front lines as they were zipping out of the fire zone for dear life in a Chinese Desert Cross 1000-3 aka golf buggy. Then also, no shortage of Russian fuel tanker losses with these two destroyed and said to have occurred at least a few miles from the front lines. Then, also in the east, the armed forces of Russia pulled out of stockpiles, then lost another self-propelled gun, the Nona S. Although not to be confused with a Soviet standard size 152mm howitzer on track wheels, this one specifically instead is a 120mm self-propelled mortar. Then, in similar fashion, we saw the destruction of a Russian self-propelled gun, the 2S1 Vozdika, which is a Soviet 122mm caliber self-propelled howitzer. This one happened in the Luhansk region, where a second flyby AFU FPV just happened to notice it. Then briefly, we move to the Zaporizhia Oblast here, somewhere we haven't been in a while as the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has achieved a significant milestone as all six reactors have reached a state of cold shutdown for the first time since October 2022. So the International Atomic Energy Association Director, General Rafael Grossi, praised the development, stating that it enhances the overall safety of the facility. Cold shutdowns provide an extra safety buffer, allowing more time before nuclear fuel cooling might be compromised in the event of an accident. And this is particularly important after Russia's destruction of the Kakovka Dam in June 2023, which had raised concerns about the cooling water availability. In fact, do note, nuclear safety chief Grossi met with Putin just last month in Russia, with the meeting largely focusing on nuclear safety and security concerns of this very nuclear plant. Then headed across to some news for the day, so the deputy commander-in-chief of Ukraine's armed forces revealed that drone deliveries to the front lines in 2024 have already tripled compared to the entire previous year. Which is impressive, although also expected given the previous year's remarks on scaling up production to well over a million drones produced by 2024, with current latest estimates having it at about 1.5 million or more drones produced. And so the deputy commander emphasized the growing importance of unmanned systems in the ongoing conflict with Russia. Now, Ukraine has intensified domestic drone production and imports, with nearly every drone supplied being domestically produced. Ukraine has also pledged to build drones of comparable range to Russian drones of up to 2,500 kilometers, all in an effort to completely level the field on this metric with their adversary. Then in some more hardware news, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky held a phone conversation with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, expressing gratitude for the supply of an additional Patriot air defense system. 
Thus, Germany will send its third Patriot system to Ukraine to help fend off increased Russian attacks. Also, the German Defense Ministry announced that the system would be handed over immediately, along with missiles for Ukraine's existing air defense systems. And as Moscow intensifies its strikes on Ukrainian cities and infrastructure, the shortage of air defense systems has been felt more acutely in recent times. Now, as previously mentioned, Foreign Minister Kaliba said he is currently focused on securing seven systems to protect Ukraine's largest cities. Kyiv is also negotiating with allies for two additional Patriot batteries and one long-range SAMP-T anti-aircraft missile battery. So as it concerns the Patriot air defense batteries, including this latest announcement for its immediate delivery, Ukraine will now have four in total. So one from the USA, three from Germany, and with what appears to be more expected by other security partner nations soon as well. But that's not all, because in more news, Zelensky announced during his evening address on April 13th that Ukraine is in negotiations with Germany to secure an additional IRIS-T air defense system which is an announcement that came mere hours after Germany's earlier announcement on the Patriot battery. Then in some other news, US officials have revealed that China is aiding Russia's massive military expansion by providing machine tools, weapons technology, and satellite imagery, according to a recent Reuters report. Despite China's official stance on neutrality in Russia's full-scale war against Ukraine, Washington continues to raise concerns about Beijing's support for Moscow's defense industrial efforts. And it appears quite true to say without Chinese support, Russia would fall flat on its face as it pertains to its war in Ukraine. So in follow-up to this, a US official stated that persuading China to stop supporting Russia's military industrial base is one of the most game-changing moves available to support Ukraine. Now, China has maintained that its partnership with Russia is normal and denies providing weapons to either side in the conflict. And so Chinese officials have urged the US to refrain from disparaging the relationship between China and Russia. But perhaps the most insidious part in all of this is... With Russia's strong reliance on China, due to otherwise being locked out of most of the remainder of the, the global market due to the sanctions, this puts China in an incredibly leveraged position over Russia. And to the point that some analysts suspect that China will be able to gain unfettered land access to the Arctic Ocean to extract a lot of those Arctic resources. And in that such relationship, Putin might start to feel what it's like to be bullied. Then in some other news, Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko called upon Ukraine and Western nations to initiate negotiations with Russia to resolve the ongoing conflict. In his statement, Lukashenko emphasized the urgency of the situation, stating, quote, Today is the moment, first of all, for the Ukrainians to sit down at the negotiating table and finally come to an agreement. But again, the last time Uncle Luca was in the middle of a negotiation, it didn't turn out too well for one party. Oh, speaking of which, the last time, and every time before, that Russia made friendship treaties or memorandums or other various security arrangements with Ukraine, oh, not to mention the Minsk I and Minsk II Accords, for which Uncle Luka and his Belarusian capital of Minsk were central parties to that negotiation, well, that didn't work out too well for Ukraine either. More importantly, what does Lukashenko know that we don't? just one day after a meeting with Putin at the Kremlin. Is it because Russia has burned through, say, 77% of their artillery systems with not a hope to replace them one for one on such a large scale? Not to mention many of their other weapons platforms. Well, most pundits or commentators alike simply suggest Russia is looking for a half-time break to build back up again for a later round. So it is suspicious, Uncle Luca's comment, likely coming straight from his Kremlin overlord. Then headed across to a couple of quick funnies to round it all off today, guys. So first one, super quick. I cannot believe I did not make mention of the last video's funny on the use of the Russian Orthodox shamanic priests performing their deeds as they flew over the 
expected upcoming floods over the, the Orenburg region of Russia. As I point to the biplane that they were sitting in. And so this plane is very, very likely the Antonov AN-2, an 8-12 to seater biplane with a production run from 1947 to 1960, which is only made more ironic by the fact that this plane was built in Kyiv. And of course, biplanes went out of style years ago, but not because of their looks, but rather because they're less efficient, less aerodynamic, and hindered performance there as well, but also surprisingly less structural integrity than their monoplane equivalents. So it's likely that Russia had to pull multiples of these out of storage and cannibalize them for making one. Well, either that or the Russian mafia authorities forcefully took a maintained one from someone within the civilian market. Then headed across to a super quick final funny to round it all off today, guys. So late night Russian state media TV is at it again, as always, continuing with their pipe dream fantasies of the Russian Empire, including for the annexation of places like Finland, Poland, Hawaii, Alaska, and California. Ah, Russia. Perhaps the only country in the world that has discussions on annexing other countries on primetime talk shows on major TV channels. That is our Russia. So thanks again for watching, guys. And in light of recent events over the weekend in the Middle East, my other channel that I've mentioned before named Juzzy News TV is semi-active again. I'll post a link below if you're interested, although, spoiler alert, it's more of a no memes, no bull channel, as it currently stands. So thanks again for watching, and I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers!